welcome to Real Vision, Jim. Thanks so much for being here. It's such an honor to have this opportunity. I've been looking forward to, to this conversation for a while now. It's, it's not too often that you get a chance like this to talk to someone with your level of experience, your track record, um, and also your approach. You know, in our industry, investors tend to be really focused on a specific strategy or a specific locality. But you've developed a strategy that is sort of go anywhere. So you'll invest across the globe and across all different property types. So I think we're going to learn a lot today from you, and, and thank you for being here. Well, Nick, it's my pleasure as well, and um, delighted to also talk about my favorite subject, which is real estate markets globally. Uh, so I uh, look forward to the conversation. Great. I thought maybe we could start by, you know, before we get into the, the state of affairs in this, this crazy emerging post-COVID world, uh, I'd love to learn a little bit more about, about you and your story. You know, where did you come from? Where did you grow up and how did you get into this business? <laughs> well, actually, I uh, grew up in uh, partly in the U.S., but also in Europe. And it, um, I, I guess that sort of planted the seed for my interest in uh, foreign languages and foreign markets, um, which I then uh, pursued when I joined a uh, real estate company. I had been in banking and joined a real estate company called LaSalle Partners, which was just sort of getting started and um, push them in the direction of two markets, two areas that I thought were very price inefficient, and that was real estate securities and also global real estate securities. Um, and this is back in the early 90s. And remember, we had the RTC and the U.S. real estate markets were blowing up. And what I noticed is when you buy the stock, you can buy the stock immediately, whereas to buy a good piece of real estate in a down market is not so easy. It can take some time whereas the public markets are for sales all the time. And then what I also noticed is pricing in markets outside the U.S. were far less efficient, far less information efficient. And, uh, and there's a much bigger gap. So, you know, I like uh, easy fat pitches down the middle. And um, this, this for me was very obvious. So I built that business out over the years. So this is the mid-90s. Uh, to today. And so I've been investing in global markets um, uh, throughout that whole whole time. And we'll, we'll invest in any market uh, anywhere in the world where there's a uh, listed real estate company. But what it does is it gets you into all the real estate markets, uh, frankly, um, because they're public companies uh, pretty much everywhere. That's, that's interesting. And when you were younger, did you know you were going to be an investor? Like when did, when did you first kind of have the realization? <laughs> You know, I, I never, I'll tell you, a friend of mine got me excited about the real estate business. I've been doing um, uh, corporate finance and, uh, you know, it was kind of boring. And the real estate guys were having a lot more fun and very different business. Uh, as you know, as a real estate investor, uh, your learning curve is always going up. You're always presented with different market opportunities and different challenges. Um, and boy, we've seen them a lot uh, since this COVID um, situation, but, but that's happened uh, throughout time. And what is also interesting is you find that real estate is something that, well, you, you might look at it as fungible, meaning it's got a similar value everywhere. It's really not. I mean, what you like in an office in LA is not what works in Hong Kong. Um, same thing with an apartment and so we, or a house. Uh, so there's a lot of uniqueness to the business, and that's what creates this price inefficiency. And I guess I you know, I went to B school in Chicago, so we were born and bred on the uh, efficient market hypothesis. And I was always... Hi, I'm Ralph Powell. Sorry to interrupt your video. I know it's a pain in the ass, but look, I want to tell you something important. Is I can tell that you really want to learn about what's going on in financial markets and understand the global economy in these complicated times. That's what we do at Real Vision. So this YouTube channel is a small fraction of what we actually do. You should really come over to realvision.com and see the 20 or so videos a week that we produce of this kind of quality of content, the deep analysis and understanding of the world around us. So if you click on the link below or go to realvision.com, it costs you $1. I don't think you can afford to be without it. And that's what creates this price inefficiency. And I guess I, you know, I went to B school in Chicago, so we were born and bred on the uh, efficient market hypothesis. And I was always trying to figure out how that was wrong. So, um, and real estate kind of proves it daily. Um, so that was really, you know, never really thought about it, um, but just 
really got intrigued by the challenges of the real estate industry that were different from what I was seeing from other businesses. Okay. And in those in those early days at LaSalle, is there like a first deal that stands out where you had like, you know, an epiphany about this this realization that you've come to that seems to have guided your strategy over the years? Well, you know, there were there were a couple of deals. Uh, one was a venture I put together with um, the Pritzker family, Hyatt Regency, and combined with, uh, believe it or not, UPS to create a new brand. Um, and it was, it was a lot of fun working with the Pritzker family, uh, who's obviously steeped in real estate. Um, and then UPS, who wasn't, it's a delivery company back then, um, only known for the brown suits and not nearly the kind of company it is today, but it was a really complicated deal. Uh, and the hotel business is even more complicated. So frankly, what I, I did, uh, I did quite a bit of um, hotel type deals. Uh, one was the, probably the most challenging was the Beaver Creek uh, workout of that resort where it, it kind of went bust and we had to restructure it. And then the other big deal that I did was um, the hotel, um, the Four Seasons Hotel in New York, which was a, a restructuring again. You know, when we were in the 90s, everything you did early 90s was, uh, you know, blow ups. Um, and so you learn from fixing problems, I think, better uh, how to do investing going forward. And you, you, you really get a lot out of that. Yeah. You can see sort of the mistakes that were made in the inception phase as you're, as you're cleaning it up. <laughs> Yeah, if you get everything right, I don't think you learn as much. Um, but I, I haven't, <laughs> and I've uh, had to learn a lot. Um, and, and boy, the problems when they're big, when real estate, when they're big, they're really big. Um, you know, the Four Seasons Hotel was budgeted to be five or 600,000 a room. It ended up costing probably close to a million uh, five per room. Uh, and, and you know, then ended up selling to the guy who set up the Beanie Babies uh, uh, for like, five or 600,000 a room. So it went all the way back down. And, you know, people talk about real estate going only up, but boy, I can show you a million examples where that's not the case. Yes, it's, it presents itself as a, as a relatively conservative investment strategy, but there's, there's quite a bit of volatility within the execution of individual strategies and markets. And you can, you know that it's it's a place where skill can actually really benefit you because you're 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 essentially a very active investor for the most part when you're dealing with assets and so you can you can develop competitive advantages that that benefit you over time it's it's, it's an area where you know battling the efficient market hypothesis is a, is a good place because there's there's just so many areas where you can do it well and you bring up a, a key point um and I use the analogy when you bought your house in LA for 200 grand and you sold it for a million bucks 20 years later, you think you made 800,000. But, you know, by the way, I put in a new furnace, new appliances, new plumbing, and all that stuff you sort of forget about. Um, and as you well know, when you own real estate, you have to, act to, have to be an active manager of that property. You can't just sit back and collect rent checks. Now, we know plenty of guys who've done that and the buildings, you know, fall apart pretty fast or the tenants disappear. Um, but it's it's a yeah, it's a, a real actively managed business, no question about it. Tell me a little bit about what you're up to these days about your firm and, and your strategy. Well yeah, we're um, frankly we're kind of adjusting to the the world. You know, pre-COVID, everybody was going to move into the cities. Um, we were all going to have autonomous cars, so parking garages would be a thing of the past. Parking ratios wouldn't make sense. Uh, everybody was going to have an office and travel by mass transit. And boy, all of a sudden that got turned on its head. So now we have outward migration. Uh, we have offices that aren't being fully used. We've got people buying cars and needing garages that they didn't, we didn't think they would need in the past. Um, a good friend of mine runs a parking garage business, and he frankly was thinking he would go out of business. Um, and and now he's he's killing it. Um, and and you know we're so we're seeing all these kinds of changes that we're trying to figure out. You know, is this durable and will it last longer, or is it ephemeral? And you know, I, of course, I lived through the 08, 09 crisis, which was a real estate driven crisis, and we kind of knew what the problems were. You know, people over levered, they built too many buildings. That was kind of easy. 
Um, this one's a real challenge and trying to figure out A, how do you handle it currently? And B, you know, if I'm investing in, in a business and I have a five-year time horizon, what's it all going to look like in, in five years? So we're, we've are we come up with a lot of uh, our own thoughts on that. Um, and in the case of the public markets, they're pricing in as much damage as they can imagine. So there's a really wide gap. Um, and, and we have things happening. I just talked to one of our clients and uh, they just sold a building in Austin, Texas at a 2% cap rate uh, because it was uh, a 1031, a desperate 1031 transaction. As you know, 1031s probably go out the door. Well, a 2% cap rate on a building in Austin is, is absurd. Um, so we're, we're seeing a lot of really interesting cross currents uh, and trying to get our arms around all that, um, both at the fundamental level, the property level, and then how is the public market pricing that? Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned that Austin example. We just sold a um, Class B apartment building in a suburb of North Atlanta, and we bought this like a decade ago. So we have a good basis because it was kind of post GFC. But the buyer paid, you know, what we believe is a pretty incredible price. Like it was in the three cap range on a building that needed substantial um, capital investments to address deferred maintenance and things like that. And uh, it's just a sign of, of the times and, and just the, the amount of capital that's out there and the compression in yield across all different types of investment opportunities. It's, it's causing interesting behavior in, in our market for sure. Yeah, you know, you contrast that with 08, 09. And when we would talk to companies, they were having banks pull out of lines of credit where the bank was supposed to show up and didn't. And now um, we have massive amounts of both debt and equity capital uh, chasing uh, whatever they can find. And it's it's really fascinating to watch that because it is totally different. And yet people will say, oh, the real estate market's tough. And well, not if you're, you know, in the midst of it trying to buy a building uh, and, we would have thought hotels would still be tough to finance. They're, they're not. There's a lot of capital for hotels now, even though they're 50% full or less uh, and they're negative cash flow. Uh, so, you know, it's yeah, we're having to, to sort of reevaluate our valuation models as well to make sure we don't miss some of this um, potential upside. Because, I you know, we would, we'd be like you looking at the apartment saying, yeah, it should trade for you know, three, 400 bucks a foot and the guy comes in and offers 500, you know, what do you do? Of course you sell, but um, you know, it's, it's a very different world. And I think that's what the public market has not really figured out. And they're worried about inflation, worried about interest rate risk and forget that we have this surfeit of capital floating around debt and equity uh, and it's global too. Um, and we see it in every market around the world. So we've not seen cap rates go anywhere but down in most urban markets, even though the office may be empty or the shop may be empty. So, you yeah, know, we're seeing two to three cap rates on retail in Hong Kong. And, you know, anybody you talk to will say that's got to be a, a terrible place to be, but, but it isn't. So yeah, interesting side of, of each story. Uh, and the other thing that's interesting, too, is every market's been very different as to how it reacted. I mean, who would have thought San Francisco office would be uh, would hit a vacancy rate of 15 plus percent and New York, same thing. Uh, you, you say that to somebody a year and a half ago, they, they tell you you're completely crazy. Um, but that's where we are. Interesting times. Definitely interesting times. And if I understand your strategy Right, I was I was able to do a little bit of research prior to this uh, conversation. You kind of have a go anywhere strategy. You have presence in in Europe and in Asia and here in the United States, and you look for opportunities to buy real estate, but through the vehicle of publicly traded securities. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure, and I think what I have learned over the years is um, we put a heavy emphasis on quality of management and quality of business strategy. So it isn't a question of buying something that's down in the dumps you hope recovers. Um, it's it's buying people who can help that property recover. But we'll look at any company anywhere in the world that's publicly listed and an owner of an operator of uh, a real estate asset. Um, 
And if, it may mean that they're a home developer and they're flipping those assets. So, you know, we'll, we'll invest in the residential business, uh, home development, as well as home rent. Um, but pretty much anything's fair game. The, the distinction we will make, though, is if we don't understand the market or the market dynamics or the property type, um, and, and for a long time, we weren't in data centers because we didn't have a clear view of that. Um, you know, we'll stay away. But, but otherwise, um, you know, we'll look at, at anything out there initially, whether we buy it or not, is obviously a different story. Okay, great. Well, we could probably talk forever but about the background the deals you've seen. And, but I'd like, to, I'd like to turn our attention now to um, the housing market. I'd love to hear, you know, one of the things that I've been focused on here in the United States is, is what's going on in housing. It's been all over the media, top of mind everywhere. You, you can't pick up a newspaper or go on a social media site without hearing something about housing. So what are, what are you thinking about housing? Yeah, and you know, the interesting thing about the U.S. market, and, and really it is unique, is that we've had the development of not only uh, homes built for individual use, single family residential, uh, or the typical apartment buildings, but you've also had homes uh, homes for rent industry develop that uh, Blackstone and some others have had built up. Not really sure, I think, when they did it initially where it was going, but now it's become an actual segment of the market. So um, you'll have families that will want to be in a certain residential area, couldn't afford to buy a house either because they don't have a down payment for it or maybe they don't qualify but they can rent in that market. And what we've now seen is an evolution of the major home builders in the U.S. Uh, building uh, complexes specifically for home rent. And again, uh, this doesn't exist really anywhere in the, U in the world except for the uh, U.S. So uh, our view right now in terms of housing across the board is we're bullish on the housing industry uh, even with construction costs, and we all know the story about lumber going up, um, but people need housing. And the transition out of the cities, maybe that's not permanent, but for sure that's going to go into rental property before they make a decision. Maybe they finally will stay in the city, but um, it, it's really created a lot of demand. And we haven't had uh, the construction uh, the activity that we used to have. In the past, if you look at 08, 09, we built way too many houses and way too many markets. I mean, you remember the stories, Vegas was just filled with houses that were empty. We had a lot of them uh, actually bulldozed over because nobody would buy them. Uh, and you know, now we're back at the point where they would have bought them. Um, so it's, it's an interesting evolution, but I think part, partly because we, the supply was constrained and now it's easy to get easier to get financing. Um, and so we've seen house prices and it's not that the home building or the home single family home uh, markets are strong in, in a lot of uh, cities around the world. Uh, no question about that. Again, though, it's been supply related um, where you've had a lot of excess supply. And again, you can't generalize in our business that well. You look at New York. We've had a massive supply in the last five years of apartments uh, and you know Hudson Yards with a lot of buildings in Manhattan that we're hoping to sell for three to seven, $8,000 a square foot, which is obviously the high end of the market, super high end. And, um, and they're going begging. And so they're converting to rent. Um, uh, and there we do see rent discounts of as high as uh, 30%. Um, but that's an urban phenomenon. And yet you go to, uh, town in Connecticut, Greenwich, and you'll now have 30 bidders on a house where, if you remember just a year and a half ago, Barry Stern looked out there saying Greenwich is a terrible place to have a house. I had one there. I lost a ton of money, I know. Uh, and so everything's timing related. So don't, don't, I'm not going to claim to be good at that. Um, but the fact is, um, we now have a shortage of housing and uh, surge in demand. Um, and it's related to interest rates. It's also related to the urban flight for the moment. Um, and we'll see, we'll see how long that lasts. But I think, you know, our view on housing is we, we just didn't make enough of it. And we've got a buildup, as you no doubt know, because of the crisis of COVID, of savings, a massive amount of savings. And all of that combined, I think we'll still see some solid demand. But it, it, in the U.S., it's, it's going to be highly segmented. Um, you'll have 
people will never want to own and they'll do the homes for rent or they'll do an apartment. Um, what we haven't seen, and, and this has surprised me, is cannibalization from the apartment sector, a high rise apartment into single family residential. Uh, there's no crossover there. And that we know that from the public companies who are in those businesses. And, and I'm frankly very surprised by that, but it hasn't happened. Yeah, and when you, when you think about this demand that we're seeing, this post-COVID demand, how much legs do you think it has? Is this like a multi-year phenomenon or is this too hard to predict? What, what are you thinking? I personally think you will have, we're running to the end of that road um, because you know we're, we're running into issues. And I think that's gonna be partly re- uh, led by the companies ordering their employees back. And right now they're being nice guys and saying, you know, you can go back for three days. Uh, they're also saying no, nobody can be out Monday and Friday, don't, you know, no long weekend stuff. I think they move into um, pre-COVID, the average was about four days per week, which I didn't know because nobody looked at the numbers uh, until recently, but maybe it gets to three and a half. Well, that's still a fair amount of time. Now, when you bought that house that's a two-hour commute, you felt okay about it because you maybe you wanted to go into work one or two days. Now the boss is saying, no, I, I need to hear four days. You know, that could change the dynamic, but it'll be slow. It'll take some time to reverse field. I do think you've had a number of people move into apartments or rental properties who moving out of the cities who want to move back. Um, and I think the argument, you know, we're all more concerned about environmental and uh, carbon footprint and all that. And I think, you know, clearly if you're driving to work every day, you know, four hours total a day, as you guys in LA love to do, apparently, um, I I think that goes away uh, or it goes in favor of some transportation, so mass transit. So I think maybe if we, but, you know, maybe we build up our infrastructure that could change and you could still live out in um, uh, what a thousand mile or thousand oaks, like a friend of mine used to call it, um, and in California area, and uh, but maybe you got a high speed train. Well, that's going to probably take. I mean, you tell me. You know, you're the area probably ten years before you see that development. So I, I do think we'll see um, people come back to the cities as the restaurants open up, as the uh, retail opens up. If you go to New York right now, you still see a lot of boarded. Um, buildings, boarded res- uh, retail and restaurants. Um, but I, I think the cities will continue to uh, survive. And so I, you know, I'm, I'm right now at a point where I, I would be careful about paying too much for your building in Austin. And I'd be looking around uh, the major cities to see if I could pick up some bargains. That makes sense. It's, it, it seems like a contrarian play, but given the trends that were in place for 20 years going into COVID, I kind of agree with you. We're like, we've noticed we own some urban um, multi here in Los Angeles. And we noticed about six months ago, uh, pickup in demand of people moving from all over the place, New York, San Francisco, the Midwest, and they're craving the, the experience of the city already. Um, but we've also noticed yeah. something, other, something else interesting in our local market. So, There was a lot of talk about this demand in housing being about moving out of the cities. And I do believe that, like you, that there's some component of it that is. But there's also another component of it that is more like a a consumer choice. Like they weren't buying houses because they were saving money and they had experienced or their family had experienced some severe stress in the last housing crisis. And COVID has convinced them that they should buy now. And they're not necessarily moving out of where they live. They're just moving around. So they're moving here in LA, for example, to a place like Thousand Oaks or Studio City or just something that has a little bit more of a sur- suburban feel or a little bit lower price of entry. And we're seeing a lot of that. I mean, those are the, those are the hottest neighborhoods are in LA. Um, but they still, in my view, they're still a city of LA, even though they're- Yeah, it, you know, if you look globally, um, the cities are all doing fine. Um, so- you know, and no one would think of, I mean, Amsterdam's a small city and that's where we have an office, but they would never think of moving outside of Amsterdam. Um, London, same thing. We're seeing uh, people want to stay around. Um, in Hong Kong and Tokyo, the offices are already full. So, you know, it, I, I just don't think the city dies. I think it adapts. Um, and, you know, that's why I say, I think if you can get a good deal in 
uh, Manhattan office building. Um, you're not the only one looking, I can tell you that, but that's, I'd rather be there. And that's one reason on the public side, we are buying into companies where they can take advantage of that and are trading at a, a discount to fair value. Yeah. Switching gears to the supply side, like you mentioned earlier about this lumber market, which is another thing that has been all over the news and people are concerned about it. I've, in my personal experience, I've felt it, you know, doing my projects around town, like it's, it's a real thing. It's happening and it's causing the prices at Home Depot and, and other places to go up. Do you think that this is transitory or do you think this is going to be a problem that's going to be with us for a while? But, you know, this reminded me of the commodity craze a few years ago when all the pension funds were buying commodity funds. And I've been reading lately that may also be part of this, because if you look at the uh, number one lumber price got up to 1700 and had been around 400, you know, it, just, and it doesn't make that much sense. It, it can't be pure demand. And what I've also heard is that people were buying it ahead of um, supply. So they created sort of like a toilet paper shortage. Uh, and, and as we well know, that's not a problem now. So um, I, I kind of think that's part of it. I think there, we've also been seeing, even in, in residential home construction, uh, the use of steel, uh, steel studs instead of uh, wood, because it's that close in price and, and boy, there's a lot of benefit if you can go to steel, if you're indifferent on the cost. Uh, but I, I really think this will fall off. I think Builders will put stuff off. I know of people right now, uh, friends of mine have just deferred uh, building a house um, because they can. Um, but I think the, the current builders who are already up and running and have commitments to finish the project, that's it's gonna be a, gonna be tough. And the question is how much of that can you pass through to the uh, the buyer? Um, and uh, you know, I I it reminds me of prior boom bust and this industry is well known for booming and busting uh the residential development business and i would expect we'll we'll start to see some some issues there but um you know very hard to say and i i think also an, an uptick in interest rates will will throttle that demand pretty quickly too yeah so zooming out you know you guys have this unique global perspective are you seeing signs of inflation or worries of inflation across the globe that make you concerned about the potential for rates to move in the other direction? Yeah, we're, um, we're really not seeing it in uh, the Asian markets, uh, nor in Europe to any degree. And the latest data I just got out today in, in Europe is inflation's you know relatively restrained. Um, one of the things you haven't had is uh, in all these markets where you have had some, like Europe, a good example, where you've had some wage subsidy, you also have very strict rules on collecting that cash and you have to have looked for a job and, and they monitor you and you have to go to train. So it's, and, or you can lose that very quickly. So you, you sort of see this, the labor force kind of growing, as soon as the jobs are open, they're going back to them. And you don't have, uh, at least we haven't heard of it, uh, operators of buildings, operators of restaurants, offering bonuses uh, for them to show up. Whereas, you know, the local hotel here has uh, 200 unfilled job listings and is offering a thousand bucks if you show up for an interview. Um, you know, that we don't hear of that anywhere in the world. And that, you know, as you know, wages are a big part of the inflation story, as is housing. Um, and housing is a big component of the CPI. Uh, but for a lot of countries, it may or may not be in there either. Uh, and, you know, just looking at bond yields, yeah, they've moved, but they haven't moved that terribly much. Um, so we're not really seeing it. Oil prices, yeah, we, you know, that's, they moved, um, but but that's, that's a hard one to read. Um, so no one's talking about it in the offshore markets. We haven't seen, uh, one thing we do know in our business is there's very little ability to push rental rates, that's for sure. So for those out there buying real estate as an inflation hedge, because they'll get a pass through on rent increases, that's gonna be a little tougher story. So I would not buy that, um, but I'd be real careful on, on rent growth assumptions. Yeah, that, that's one of the phenomena that we, we actually started noticing pre-COVID in the established markets was that the, the traditional strategies that worked for about a decade, they worked great. You could buy properties and 
make some kind of improvement to them and, and raise the rents, I kind of really started to run into headwinds in the most expensive jurisdictions, at least the, the LA is in the San Francisco, New York. And uh, I could certainly see how that's kind of spread across the globe. It's one of the reasons why we sold that apartment in Atlanta. It's like the only way that deal makes any sense for the buyer is to literally raise rents by double digits. It's the only way they make the, you know, they're trying to make an opportunistic return of over 10 or 15%. There's no way you can do it unless you raise the rents. But we, we find that to be, you know, a risky proposition to have a business strategy like that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, especially when cap rates are, you know, four or 5%, um, you really, it's, it's just hard to move the needle already because you're paying a pretty good price on a per square foot basis. And if you can't get that rent up, um, yeah, it's a tough, tough proposition. What would, uh, what would a big move in interest rates do to the global real estate market? Like what if we had a 100 basis point move higher? Like that, like happened maybe in 2013 when there was that big move. What would that do to offices and properties across the globe? Well, you know, I can tell you in the the REIT business because there's a dividend yield associated with a REIT. Uh, they typically get hit hard right away if it's a a very quick ramp up in rates. So let's say between now and the end of um, July. Rates go from 150 to three percent. Everything gets hit. Um, then you you take a step back and say, okay, my stock's down, you know, 10, 15 percent, maybe more. But do do the tenants uh, have a chance, or do the owners of real estate have a chance to raise rents because it's it's been uh, pushed by economic growth? If it's an overly aggressive central bank. Um, trying to get ahead of inflation, ahead of the curve, like Paul Volcker, then all bets are off. And that really is what caused the financial crisis um, uh, back in the 90s. Um, if you can, if you're tracking with economic growth, so let's say GDP growth goes to 8% magically and interest rates go to three, then um, you're already getting rent growth in your building. You know it, you're, you're raising rents on tenants, you feel it. Um, and, you know, that suddenly kind of washes away. So our worries are always, is the central bank a, ahead of the curve or behind the curve? And by how much? And, you know, and then the other problem is figuring out what are interest rates, what does the 10-year bond market tell us these days? Right now it's saying things look pretty benign, but we also have central banks globally uh, buying in the bonds, right? So they're artificially... Uh, tamping down um, the rates. So we, we've we been factoring in the last couple of years, but we see, think it's sort of a normalized 10-year uh, treasury in our financial models. So it's inflation plus, you know, something, 50 basis points um, or 100 basis points. So we're sort of assuming a 3% risk-free rate or maybe as much as four in the case of the U.S. We never did get there. And in the case of Europe, as you know, the math kind of blows up when you're using negative interest rates. <laughs> and, um, and it was weird. I don't know if you know, but back in day, it was about a year ago in Denmark, when you took out a mortgage, the bank sent you a payment every month. You didn't send a mortgage payment. In. That's a bizarre concept. Um, yeah, that's fascinating. <laughs> so I, yeah, I don't think that goes again. Yeah. In the, in the housing market, when you look out across the world, are there any other countries or regions that are experiencing you know, bullishness like you're seeing here in the U.S.? Is there any place else that's exciting for investors to look? Well, you have excitement, but then you also have concern because prices have, have risen quite a bit. So uh, Sydney, Australia is a great example. Again, though, it's been more of a supply constrained market. And so that's been pushing prices. Um, London, believe it or not, um, still pretty strong. Um, not as strong, but but still strong. Um, Hong Kong, you know, we still see deals get done at for not, you know top quality buildings, but um, you know eight to ten thousand dollars a square foot U.S. Um, those are some pretty big numbers. Um, and uh, I I think pretty much every market, uh, Munich, Amsterdam, uh, Paris, because of the low interest rates, uh, people have been able to buy places. And again, these are all relatively supply constrained markets. So that's been a large part of it. And they're all trying to stimulate new construction, but 
as you probably know in Europe, uh, the NIMBY concept is really strong. Nobody wants anybody building anything and they protest like crazy. So it's very hard to add to supply. It's one of the reasons that uh, you've probably been following or may have followed the German, the Berlin authorities trying to cap rates and um, it really cast a fall over the market until it was declared to be illegal. And what happened was rent, rent growth, because in Germany, they'd rather rent than own pretty much. And uh, rents were, were soaring in Berlin. And, and that's an area where you have a lot of uh, you know, creative types that don't want to pay much in rent. And that's always been history and very low rent. And then all of a sudden it, it got more gentrified and rents got uh, way out of whack. And so the government said, okay, enough. And they basically um, fixed the price. They actually call it a, a rent price break uh, is what in German. And what happened, of course, was no one built any supply and no one who had rent control would leave their building. So if you needed housing in Berlin, you basically had to stay in a tent. Um, so it, 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 you know, classic uh, effort on the part of the government to ease the pain and actually went the other way and created more pain. And so now that's been erased and they're trying to come up with some other ideas. Um, that's something, you know, we see this, one of the challenges of investing in, in the residential sector for us globally is it's one of the most government manipulated sectors. You know, if you want to buy votes, you have people build cheap buildings and you subsidize rents. And all of a sudden your economics as a landlord blow up. Um, so we, yeah, we're very mindful of that um, in a lot of these markets. Yeah, that, that's fascinating. The, the regulatory stuff is, uh, is a much bigger deal than people realize like here, here in Los Angeles, this is like the this the NIMBY capital of America. And it's it's a real problem to as a developer. We have some projects and our stuff is small scale, but every time we get a bunch of neighbors who don't want it, they don't want anything built, no matter what it is, even if you hire the best architects in the city, uh, and it's a beautiful building. Um, and what's really interesting about it to me is that there's this sort of cognitive dissonance in the in the NIMBY narrative in the United States because you get people who are angry about the affordability crisis for housing and angry about the homelessness crisis. And, and rightfully so, that it's, these are things that are important public policy. But then every time a developer proposes to add new supply to the neighborhood, they throw a fit and try to do whatever they possibly can do to prevent the, the construction moving forward. And so it's this weird juxtaposition of, of points of view that don't seem to make any sense. They're happy if it's built in the other guy's neighborhood, just not yeah. your own. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so it's, yeah. It's, it's fascinating to hear that that's happening in uh, sort of continental Europe. I had been loosely tracking that German story um, for a while now, and it sounds like it, it, it just got resolved within, within a few weeks, right? We did, and, but now there's, there are other initiatives to try to figure out how to address the problem. And that the same sort of thing happened in... Um, in Finland, and they realized, you know, if we shut off supply, that's the wrong way to go. So the, the way to beat it and beat rents is to allow builders to build whatever they want, when they want. And then, but then you got to force the local people like you, you're having to deal with to suck it up. And all of a sudden they got a high rise building in their backyard. Um, so, it, you know, in a socialist environment, maybe you can pull that off. It's a little harder uh, in, in the US uh, to dump supply in a market. Yeah, especially in California. Yeah, California. Yeah. Uh, and I guess the extreme opposite would be China. I mean, you have you all have been invested in China for quite some time. So what's going on? Yeah. There? Well, you know, Chinese um, demand and and people do forget that incomes have been growing there about um, ten to twelve percent per annum for decades, and so that means your income's doubling about every seven years. And there's a lot of pent up demand over the years. Because originally the government would give you your housing and it was pretty crappy stuff and it fell apart, but then they allowed you to buy a house. And now you, you just so you know, you, you don't actually own the house, you, it's on a ground lease, right? So the government always still has a right to take it away, but you know, practically that doesn't happen. And, um, and then you, you have two things happening. One, you have speculative buyers who have a lot of cash, and then you also have those funded by 
you know, with one child, you have two sets of grandparents and two sets of grandparents can help you get start, get your starter home. So uh, we've seen lots of um, new construction, but we are also seeing, and you may have read about this group called Evergrande, and uh, they're, they've gotten way out over their skis and everything they've done, tons of leverage. Uh, but the, the guys we like use very little leverage, uh, almost no leverage. And they're also taking uh, deposits from the buyer that amount to roughly 100% of construction costs over time. So they got progress payments, big deposits up front and then progress payments. So they, they kind of de-risk the project. But there's, there's plenty of demand for the right kind of product, just like anywhere in the world. And then there's stuff that gets built that nobody wants to touch. So we've had ghost towns for sure uh, in the last cycle, in 08, 09, a ton of, of those. Um, and those have all kind of gone by the wayside. And now, now you've got a fairly rational pace of uh, building and finance. Uh, but the government, you know, every, any, any day now they might say, uh, hey, we're going to raise the down payment requirement. And all of a sudden demand falls off. Uh, or they won't approve what they, one of the main things they do is they just don't approve the project. And they slow down construction that way. But it's, it's heavily managed, as you would expect in China. And yet, um, for us, the companies, uh, you know, they'll trade down to 40, 50 percent below NAV, and the NAV is getting um, valued pretty much every day because they're selling houses every day. So, um, so it's actually it's a great business, but you just have to know what you're doing. Are you and there? We do stay with the better guys. Yeah. Are you are you currently bullish on these these discount to NAV opportunities in China? Yeah, yeah, we're um, we're we're investing in those companies, but but again, it's more um, it's a rifle shot approach. Uh, private private guys we know well and deliver a great product that everybody wants, um, but not um, not the commodity type housing. Yeah. Okay. Maybe we'll close this conversation on housing by talking about Hong Kong because I, I read in one of your recent up, updates, investor updates about these these really incredible retail or residential transactions that were trading, you know, 11,500 per square foot, you know, to put things into context for Americans, like a neighborhood like Beverly Hills 90210 at best would trade for like 2000 a square foot. Like that's a, a huge win. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah. London can get, London can get up to, you know, eight to 10,000 a foot, but that's rarefied air for them. Um, some of the, you know, the, the demand is really coming from the newly minted wealthy in China uh, wanting to have kind of like wanting to have a place in New York. Right. Um, but for them, Hong Kong's New York, it's a status symbol. Um, and, and they're not worried at all about um, a political story because obviously they came from China. Um, so a lot of it's Chinese, wealthy Chinese money. Um, we are seeing. Uh, Chinese investors regularly in our Singapore office, who you know we thought might have 50 to 100 million, turns out they've got five to 10 billion net worth. Um, these are you know, one of the guys was a, a, an original um, employee at Alibaba, and he retired 15 years ago, but he's probably got 15 or 20 billion bucks. Um, so you see a lot of that. Um, it's, you know, I don't think it's really a case of black money like a lot of markets we know of. It's people hiding cash. Mm -hmm. So now they use Bitcoin maybe, but they also like to buy a house to hide out. But, um, you know, we've seen, um, we've seen these prices for a long time. They, they'll vary and they will do speculative buying. So you might see someone who will buy in at 10,000 a foot thinking they'll be able to sell it at 12,000 a foot. Um, so there's some of that going on as well. Um, but yeah, the numbers, you know, they're just astounding. <laughs> and it's all high rise. They've all got great views, a lot of security, all that stuff. But you know, you, for 2,000 bucks a foot in LA, you can get that too. Um, or uh, maybe 3,000 New York. But so, I, I, you know, I, but, but I think we underestimate when you've got a population of a billion three, how many, you know, multi-millionaire billionaires are floating around where this is really not a big deal. They love real estate. And, you know, maybe they're going to buy a jet, but they bought the apartment first. So yeah, plenty of those guys out there. Yeah. And it goes back to what you mentioned earlier in your remarks about supply. Like for whatever reason, the residential market is, is an area where supply is 
sometimes constrained artificially either by regulation or market conditions. And so we, we just went through like a decade of recovery from the housing bust. And it, it seems like globally, housing is a problem. And it's becoming a political problem because it's becoming too expensive. And it, this is not just the U.S. issue now. It's everywhere. Well, that's one of our favorite investment opportunities right now is, uh, especially in the U.S., we're working with a couple of groups, uh, low-income housing. Um, and, you know, the challenge is, as you know, getting the zoning uh, and, and also building to a cost that is going to give you a reasonable return. Most low-income housing guides are refurbishment types, and they got a great deal on the building. It needed a lot of work, and um, and they could still rent it out at a reasonable price. Um, but it's a, it's a it's a challenge, and every country in the world is trying to figure out how they can skin that cat. Um, yeah, but it's not easy given construction costs and land costs, and then the other issue. Uh, you know, we invest in manufactured housing. Uh, the reason we invest in manufactured housing, it's they're a lot nicer, by the way, than trailer parks. Uh, but that's what comes up in people's minds, and they don't want a trailer park in their area. So when these guys go for planning and zoning, they quite often get rejected. Yeah. Well, that's why we like it. High barriers to entry. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, the the affordable housing space is is a is a fascinating space. It's one worth looking at for people who are kind of looking for like a good long term opportunity. And the, the reason I think it's so exciting is just the, the scale of money that's about to be thrown at this space. Exactly. Yep. The, the ESG funds are all yep. looking for affordable housing. Yep. Yep. They need it. The countries need it. And, you know, here in the U.S., you know, they're, they're talking about dramatic expansion in the programs that fund these. So your, your Section 8 program, for example, was chugging along at like, 20 billion and they're talking about bringing it like two or three x that in, in going forward for the next 10 years and, and that's just a massive amount of money that's going to be available yeah. for subsidies um, that's a great business and again though as you well know it's not that easy to execute it yeah. sounds great on paper and you can get the money uh, but can you find the projects yeah try building an affordable housing complex in venice california <laughs> um I think this would be a, a good time now to switch over to office because office is another uh, segment of the market that has been absolutely top of mind. Uh, it, and it's, it's becoming maybe not controversial, but it's becoming an issue here in the U S for corporations, because now we've, we've trained an entire generation of workers of, of a new way of conducting business. And there's, there doesn't seem to be a settled viewpoint about what the go forward situation should be like for a big multinational corporation or a law firm or a bank. And there's, there's strong opinions on either side. And I know you all have seen what's happening across the globe and have some unique perspectives on office. So what do you think is going on there? Well, I think, you know, the U.S. is where you're seeing the, the greatest amount of turbulence um, because everybody, the companies, space planners, leasing agents are trying to figure out what's a good number of days in the office and how much space are you going to need. If you look at the Asian markets, um, it's back to work as normal. And even with a lockdown in Singapore, where you're not supposed to be going to the office, next week they're all planning on going to the office and they do not want to miss it. Um, so, you know, it's really more a focus on the U.S. and how space gets used going forward uh, than, than almost anywhere else. Um, London, same thing. We see people wanting to come back to the office. Um, maybe they'll work out an extra day or two here or there but with, with the boss, but I, I think they'll all end up showing up. The, the, the key thing for us is we're looking at the next several years Will a current tenant, one of the multinational companies, might have taken more space to warehouse in anticipation of growth? And I don't know if they're going to do that anymore. Um, maybe down the road when we're all back in the office and we have another, uh, another round of vaccines and we're all 100% good. But, uh, you know, I think, what we're, I think for the next few years, we're going to have this out over our heads saying, well, maybe there's another variant coming out. So maybe I should still allow for not five days in the office, but three to four. Um, 
And so I think tenants are going to be very sensitive to that. We are seeing already great benefits for WeWork and the where WeWork almost went bust. Now it, it's back to being a great uh, product and, um, and flex space. Um, so I, I think, you know, as we look at valuations for office space, we're tempering our growth rate in rent, if at all, and um, focusing on markets where we have supply overhang potential uh, because we could get hit by the proverbial bus um, if things don't really change much from where they are today uh, with that supply. So New York has a ton of supply. Uh, I, I do think the companies are gonna order people back um, more or less, uh, but they'll be very careful about what they take on um, in terms of new space. Uh, and yet you've got JP Morgan building a monstrous headquarters in Midtown. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's the funniest thing. I've never seen so many people so confused about what to do going forward, including, you know, the whole, the whole gamut, the space planners, the leasing agents, the companies. Um, and they're all, I think they're all kind of playing the game of let's see what happens in September and then try to figure out a plan. And some are announcing their plans, but I think they'll change those. Um, so, you know, going forward, we're we're of the view that um, office is a good thing to be buying with a five-year time horizon, but maybe not five months. Interesting. And are, are there opportunities in, in the public market to to buy, you know, office REITs, for example, or office type uh, companies and and get a good deal at this point, or have they all rallied rallied with the rest of the world? No, they, you know, it's it's definitely been the those who focus on suburban office uh, have done really well. And those like Boston Properties who focus on center city and the gateway cities uh, have not done as well. And in fact, Boston Properties just announced a venture. They haven't identified who it is with a couple of sovereign wealth funds to buy properties and using that sovereign wealth fund capital because they can't issue stock at a discount. And yet they see some really interesting opportunities. So that. That to me is telling the story right there. Um, we'll probably see some take private situations. We know a few that are that are out there uh, because the stocks are far cheaper than the underlying real estate. Um, but that's only in the case of the uh, more urban locations, which is interesting because if you contrast that with logistics, if you have a uh, an urban infill logistics kind of company, it's on fire and trading probably 50% above NAV. Yeah, the office guys are, you know, 20 plus percent below fair value. Yep. So, yeah, there are definitely opportunities. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, it seems like I, I listened to a few of the earnings calls for the big office REITs that hold the global portfolios. And what was really fascinating about it was that they were just comparing contrasting Asia. They're like, look, in Shanghai, we're at 90 something percent occupancy. And so it, it it makes you think like, okay, maybe when when COVID is a distant memory in the US, that we will kind of get back to a, a state of normalcy. And and the office market looks really oversupplied today, but with a growing economy in five years of or three to five years of time, you know, maybe it won't be oversupplied. And maybe office will do just fine. What do you think of that? Well, I think that's right. And I think as long as you underwrite to rents that aren't going to zoom, you know, that if I'm getting, you know, 80 bucks a foot in New York, maybe five years from now, I get 85. If you're building in some fairly conservative assumptions and the, and you can still buy it and take it off the market. Yeah, I think that makes total sense. I just, I think right now, um, there's so much capital that you'll be uh, outbid um, pretty quickly. Um, and people will be willing to accept low returns for a long period of time. Uh, thinking that they'll get the rents, but maybe it's five years out. So I think the actual ability to buy the building is, and that's why we're in the stocks. It's just a whole lot easier. I get, I get to buy them every day, and it's a forced sale at a low price. Um, but if I'm trying to buy an office building in New York, even the ones that have just been developed and we know have to be on water, underwater, um, and and you know I'm thinking one Vanderbilt. It's a beautiful building right by the Grand Central. Um, you know, they were kind of, they kind of needed $160 rents a square foot to, to 
get over their construction, but make some profit in construction. And I just don't see them getting those rents even close on a net effective basis. So, but they aren't going to sell either. If you could buy it and you can buy the public company that, that developed it, but if you could buy that building, I think they're going to hold out for something closer to that. Uh, I think they're in at uh, 1700 bucks a foot, maybe, maybe higher. Uh, they won't really accept anything uh, below that. So your opportunity to buy in at these discounted prices is, is not so great, uh, except for the public market for the moment. That's yeah, and that, that's one of the fascinating things to me about your strategy because it gives you it gives you the chance to take advantage of these anomalies where, you know, in the um, in the office space, assets are trading in the private sale market at lower cap rates than what you could buy the the REIT portfolio for. So you have this like instant arbitrage of uh, opportunity that you can take advantage of. Yeah, and it, but it's very property type specific. So for example, in an apartment complex in your neck of the woods, uh, I might be paying a, a premium um, over what you're paying on the ground. So uh, yeah, you got to pick your spots, that's for sure. Yeah. And it's interesting that it, it moves around like that. And it, it probably does more often than you think. And that that creates these opportunities for, for you to, to make good returns. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's and that's what we got to watch. And that's Frankly, how I got into this business, I was doing it U.S. only for a while, and I realized if I can do it globally, I have more chances to hit pockets of declines and take advantage of that than if I'm stuck in the same market all the time. Yeah, definitely. So it seems like in office, to summarize the thoughts on that, it seems like the players that own offices are, are pretty well capitalized. The lending environment is still there, and everyone's kind of taking a wait and see, despite, you know, pretty low occupancy rates, at least here in the US and in other parts of the world, like Europe and London. Um, but there's no signs of distress anywhere in, in value. Yeah, we, yeah. yeah, all these guys last summer built up these distress funds. And, you know, we don't see much distress out there at all. Uh, there is some in, you know, some shopping centers and, um, Obviously, the movie theater business, although AMC stock up 3,000% solved a lot of problems, but they were that was one that was about to go bust. Um, hotels, we thought, were going to have real struggle uh, finding buyers or financing. That's not been the case. Uh, so, yeah, there really has there's nothing at all like the RTC days when I was buying land for 25 cents on the dollar and, uh, and buildings not much higher than that. And then you know, doubling or tripling your money—that that's just not happening. And um, you know, we're just in a new world. We've got sovereign wealth funds with tons of cash and demand. They all like real estate. We've got all the pension funds allocating even more money to real estate. Um, and then you've got people flush with cash just globally, um, savings. So, um, so it's a cash-rich world. And um, you know, the property sector is. You know, weak in some areas and not so weak in others, but it, but bargain wise, it's very tough to find. Yeah, I, I keep wishing for a day to come back like that, 2010 to 2013, when it, in at least for my career, that was like your RTC moment. There were these incredible opportunities. Oh, yeah. The properties were actually trading for, you know, far less than replacement cost, and it, it was, you know, that that crisis cause a lot of problems in, in the real estate. Um, and th this time things are just different. You know, one of, one of the questions I was gonna ask you, but I forgot to ask, which is, if you could take yourself back to February of 2020, you're a global investor, you've got eyes on the ground in Asia. What do you think is about to happen to the real estate market, you know, given, given what was going on in Wuhan? Well, you know, we were at that point, um, the real estate markets pre-COVID were, were really strong. Um, a lot of rent growth. We still weren't seeing a whole lot of supply. And we were feeling pretty good about things. Uh, more worried about overvaluation. Um, and then the whole bottom dropped out um, of certain sectors. Uh, the one area that we probably we missed and in retrospect, you know, should have been smarter about is e-commerce. Um, and logistics. Uh, we, we were in it, but not as heavily as we might have been. 
Um, and, and I should have foreseen that because the rent levels and retail started to get way out of hand. And these poor retailers were really struggling to pay the rent with sales relatively modest, but the landlords just kept jamming them and thinking they could forever. And, um, and meanwhile, there's Jeff Bezos out there with the Amazon alternative. And, you know, you didn't have to worry when you went into the store, it didn't have your shoe size and you got frustrated and you had to drive home empty handed and he's got it on your doorstep uh, within a day or two. Um, and, and that, so the retailers shot themselves in the head, the landlords shot themselves in the head. And we, I wish we'd been a little smarter about seeing that trend. And of course, COVID just totally accelerated it. Um, and, and now it's a, it's a very different world. And in fact, now I would be buying into bricks and mortar uh, or more tempted to buy in bricks and mortar retail with the right retailers and uh, smart concepts because it's now getting cheaper to have that storefront than, um, than putting all your stuff in with, uh, with Amazon. Interesting. So on the, yeah, on we're getting to that point, yeah. Yeah, on the retail front, so if I, if I understand your point correctly, the, there has been some price declines in the retail sector. And at the same time, the e-commerce alternative, which you mentioned, is becoming more and more expensive because it's kind of blown up in the last 12 months. So I'm, I'm imagining, I don't have the, the charts in front of me, but I imagine if you pull up a chart of one of these logistics REITs or something, it's probably done amazing, right? Oh, they've been, yeah, killing it. Um, and trading way above even inflated, what I would consider inflated underlying values. So they're trading way above fair value and the values are about the strongest. I mean, we're seeing logistics trade at, you know, what used to be office rates, uh, you know, and, and yeah, it's all a function of huge demand and it doesn't seem to be abating. I'm, I'm talking with one of the largest owners of, uh, private owners of uh, logistics uh, warehouse space around the country. And, you know, he said he's enjoying the ride. Uh, didn't expect it and it's gonna keep going uh, for maybe another, well, who knows, another year or two, but um, but we'll see. I, I just think, you know, getting back to my, the point about the rent rent differential, you know, for a retailer, instead of maintaining that storefront and paying what was a pretty high rent, you know, they just, they have everything at, at the warehouse and they take out the middleman effectively is how that worked. Mm -hmm. uh, and the retail landlord was the middleman. Um, now, um, you know, the rent's getting back to earth. Uh, maybe that, that does work and that does compete against um, the logistics guys. Um, but, you know, um, right now the money is still flowing uh, in that direction. Yeah, it seems that way. It seems that they're they're getting double digit rent increases. It's like the uh, the multifamily pre COVID sector, where you could buy urban multi. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, and what you got to watch is when those rents, as a percentage of sales, start to get up in that you know twelve to fifteen percent rent range, then it's cheaper to be at the store. And remember, returns are what forty plus percent of sales. So, and there's a high cost of returns. Um, and in fact, a lot of retailers now just tell you, don't even bother sending it back if it doesn't work. You know, uh, it's too expensive for me to restock. Those numbers don't work long-term. So we'll see. That's interesting. Another area that's been really hot is the data centers. Did you guys get involved in those? Yeah, and we were late to that party too, partly because I, you know, I had a bad experience in data centers in the nineties and um, when, when the tenant didn't show up, I had this uh, uh, $2,000 a square foot cost pillbox that I couldn't give away to charity. Um, so we were slow, but you know now it's taken on a whole different um, flavor. And you've got uh, companies like Equinix who control the junction points. So kind of like the train, they're like the train station where everybody has to go through. So they've got uh, uniqueness of, of situs, as we say in real estate. They've got barriers to entry. And, you know, let's face it, we're all using the internet like right now. Uh, and, and that doesn't go away. Maybe, you know, video games get played less when you're forced to go back to the office and you can't hide it from the boss. But I, I think um, it's just going to keep going. And that, but, but notice this, the big growth for companies like Equinix is not the U.S. anymore. It's offshore. And so that's the interesting 
point, if you're buying into that data centers in the US, you know, are you still in, in a great position or not? And that, I think the jury's out on that one because part of the problem is if you're not controlling that junction center, then you're more or less a commodity type company. You're, the, you're selling it to, well, companies like ours, you know, we need, we need access to the internet, we need rack space. So, you know, we rent it from some guy for a two year lease. Um, and what I've always struggled with is it, it really is a technology business, technology as a service and not a real estate concept. And even rent is tracking uh, your power utilization, not, um, not some sort of space rent. So I know that's old fashioned, uh, but I, you know, it's not bricks and mortar, it's, it's air that you're renting, so. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense to me. It reminds me actually of another one that's kind of hot right now, which is Ghost Kitchens which is kind of being presented to the world as a real estate play, but it's a, it's more of a nuanced play because you you can't just have a kitchen. You need to know how to like find people to use it and, and how to operate it. And, and the same kind of dynamics that you were describing for data centers. Yeah, it's complicated. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and, then there, and then you really have to analyze what's the revenue stream look like and who's it coming from and yeah. how comfortable are you. And the thing about data centers, they won't tell you who the tenants are. It's top secret. So you can't even do a traditional, like when you go into a building, you're going to buy a building you do due diligence on. The tenant, you know who the tenants are. You know roughly what the rent's like. Here, they, they won't tell you. It's very yeah. interesting. Yeah, that makes it hard to, to evaluate a given property. Yep. Or even yeah. 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 Okay, so we're coming to the end of our time, but I wanted to uh, maybe do some kind of rapid fire questions, if you're okay with it. Sure, sure. Okay, great. Right away. All right. So the first one is, is what's happening to the valuations of real estate in countries that are really struggling with COVID, like Brazil or India? Yeah, interesting point. Um, the, uh, from a stock perspective, they've really started to recover, which is not surprising because they'll recover ahead of it. Um, but each market has a very different structure real estate. So if we look at commercial real estate in Brazil, the tenant really had controls. It's just more of a socialist environment. So they have a, an easy way to get out of e each lease. So there's not a lot of rental security there. And the office market is more condominiumized as opposed to multi-tenant buildings. And so now I've got a whole bunch of owners in a building. So it's, it's more complicated that way. Uh, the retail story, same thing. You've got very short-term leases that people can walk out on. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think the, they are from a, a, a property buyer's perspective, if you're buying direct, there are great opportunities in those markets as long as you're comfortable with the next outcome, which is both political and virus oriented and COVID oriented. The same, you know, India has the same sort of political issues as well. Um, their market, the companies we've looked at and we, we actually like, um, like Blackstone's invested in one of them that we like a lot, um, is a residential developer. Uh, and there are some good office developers there. Uh, Gerald Hines has been in that market quite a bit, actually, uh, in Bangalore. Um, so there, there are ways to play it. Um, it's just not that well established a market for the buyer's side of things. So you're you're flipping it maybe to some local guys. And the other problem in India in particular is land assemblage. They call these guys aggregators. And you're not really ever sure about clear title. And that's one of our big issues um, in that market. So yeah, with a lot of, uh, and, and Blackson's been there a long time. I don't know if they've made any money. It's just been a tough slog. You would think it would be easy. You've got 300 million engineers. Um, you got great educational system. But then you also have um, extreme levels of poverty uh, and, um, and transportation is horrific. So uh, actually that's a business, you know, if you can crack the nut on logistics and we, we have some investments in that arena and public companies, um, that, that's, that's a great place uh, to go. Um, originally logistics was not great because your grocer would automatically send somebody out. Labor was so cheap it was cheaper to have them go out on, on their little uh, 
bicycle or, or motorbike and drop stuff off uh, than for you to go to the store. And so they've been doing this for years. They just hadn't formalized the structure. So um, lots of potential, but it's one of those, it's kind of like Argentina that uh, people have been talking about the great potential for decades and it's never happened. And so we're, we've studied it. We spent a lot of time in India. Um, we still haven't gotten that comfortable with uh, how you can make money there. And, and for us, it's more problematic because they have a really complicated, expensive um, registration system for investors. So it's not, it's not that easy to get in and out. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, next one. Climate change and the move towards you know, carbon credits and the regulatory environment, is that a problem for the global real estate industry? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, ESG is, of course, big for all investors and something we look at. And one of the things companies talk about is their carbon footprint, but we have no way of knowing what that means. And I'll give you a great example. Uh, data centers can score very high because maybe they put a solar panel or two on the roof, but they're, they're huge uh, energy sucks. And uh, in the case of anybody located in Northern Virginia, they're using uh, a lot of coal power. So what you have to do is look through to, you know, the details and, and we're actually doing this sort of exercise, not on a superficial way, but to say, you know, what are, what exactly, uh, how are you sourcing power? And let's, let's do a look through to all of the sources. In fact, I just got this today and it's called, um, um, what's it called? Indirect source rule. And this is a Southern California thing that just came out for warehouses. So they're basically taxing you for the trucks that come to your facility as a landlord. And then you try to pass that on to the tenants. So, you know, all this stuff, there are a couple of things. There's, there's climate change, which can affect your coastal markets. And it's something, you know, we're looking at, we just don't know how to evaluate it that easily. Um, and then the other thing is energy use or, you know, companies being smart about uh, the buildings and how much energy they use has been happening for the last decade. You know, smart material, low E glass, um, heat pumps, all that stuff, because, you know, it saves you money in, in operating the property. So that all makes tons of sense. But then when it comes to carbon footprint, if I'm a shopping center, I really need to measure the carbon footprint of the cars coming to my store if they're not all uh, electric cars. And then for the electric cars, where are they getting their power? Is it a coal fire plant or is it something else? So I think there's a lot of stuff up in the air, um, a lot of greenwashing we're running into on the stock side. So ESG funds that don't do the homework on it, um, but just say that they're green. And we know, um, you know, the SEC's made a number of inquiries into this to make sure that you know, what you say is, is real. And if I'm claiming that we're investing in companies with low carbon footprints, how do I really assess that? And I don't have a good answer for that yet. Yeah. But we're watching it for sure. Yeah. It's, it seems too early to tell. It seems a little chaotic. There's a lot of energy directed towards it. There's venture capital aligning itself towards that space. And the built environment is definitely in the crosshairs. There's no question about it. They're going to come after the, the liberal jurisdictions who are pursuing these strategies, or maybe all jurisdictions, the way things are heading, it looks like it might be all jurisdiction. And so the, the real estate owners of the world have to pay attention to it. Yeah, I think so. I think what will happen really soon is um, much better building ventilation because of worries about COVID. And yeah. that's not that high a cost. And yet um, buildings have not been recirculating air very uh, often, like once a day. And I think they're going to start, you know, doing that. So, we'll, you know, we expect to see that sort of thing. And that may actually cause tenants to move in the direction of the more modern buildings. And so we are worried about older quality buildings with older systems uh, that don't have more open space so that you can space it out, that don't have elevators that can adjust to uh, lower numbers in the car, you know, so uh, you make an appointment for the elevator. Right now, it's easy to do for the high quality buildings. Um, you're on your phone, it goes in, it tells you what elevator you're on, and they can limit the numbers easily. But in these older buildings, tough things. So we do expect a big uh, decline in values for older quality uh, office buildings, and there are plenty of those in New York. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, that's, a, that's probably going to be a big trade. 
um, because the install base around the globe, the install base of real estate is really dated. Oh, yeah. 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 And nobody's got anything really to worry about it for a long time. (laughs) Yeah, seriously. Okay, so last question. What's the best opportunity that you're seeing in the whole world? Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, because for us, it's, you know, we're really company focused. So we've got this um, great little company in the UK and they, um, they somehow they've figured this out for, for um, they call it PRS, it's a private rental um, scheme. And it's rental housing um, and apartments and that sort of thing. And then also student housing. They're able to do development, but take it through planning and zoning on an option basis. And we just don't see that done in a lot of places around the world, but they've been able to pull that off. And there's huge demand for that kind of property. So um, anything related to housing, especially low-income housing, we're looking for, uh, and, and that's... Not globally, but in in select markets. Um, the other thing, you know, we are we still see things get beaten down by sentiment. So everybody hates China, then values the stock price to go down, and then that creates a phenomenal uh, opportunity. Just to give you an idea, those developers I mentioned in China were investing in pay hey, about a, a seven to nine percent dividend yield, and they've got it covered. And that's not a bad return while you're waiting for that discount to NAV to narrow. Um, office, uh, we definitely like, I think that's a great opportunity, urban office, especially in the U.S., uh, but also offshore. And we're absolutely looking at retail, uh, even though uh, my good buddy, uh, I don't know if he'd say that, but uh, John Gray, who I know, uh, I've known for a while, um, he'll tell you at Blackstone, we, we're not doing retail. Well, I, you know, who knows um, what they're doing behind the scenes. But I think, I think retail is something you've got to look at. Um, in the public markets, it's priced like it's going to die in most places. And there's some really great operators out there. Um, U.S., there's a great company. Um, we like him a lot because he's a real uh, rifle shooter. He's been a smart player for years called Acadia, Ken Bernstein. Um, and, and, but there are lots of these really good companies that they don't have to be cheap. They just have to be smart operators. So there's another company um, called Terreno. Uh, they do infill industrial. They, uh, they came out of the private equity world and just very disciplined buyers. So we get excited about companies with a good strategy, a history of good execution and uh, good governance. Yeah, those, and it's in every market. We find them everywhere. Um, yeah, those sound definitely worth looking into. Well, Jim, this was really fun. Thank you for uh, being so open and sharing your thoughts uh, across all these different topics and all these different jurisdictions. I learned a ton and I, I think the audience at, at Real Vision is, uh, is going to learn a ton as well. So thank you very much for your time today. Well, thanks for having me. And I also enjoyed the conversation. Thank you, Nick. I hope you enjoyed this special episode of the interview, the premier business and finance series in the world. However, this is just the tip of the iceberg. For more in-depth content and expert analysis, visit the membership link in the description to unlock a week's access for only $1. This dollar can change your life.